This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Thank you, Aaron. So it's my pleasure today to introduce Walter Zhang. Um, Walter is a Bachelor of Veterinary Science Honours graduate um, from 2015 from the University of Queensland. Um, and he's worked as a veterinarian in private practice for some years and has also done um, a bit of other types of work as well, including in the Department of um, Agriculture and Fisheries in the Queensland Government um, and a bit of work in a diagnostic lab at UQ as well. Um, so Walter joined us as a PhD candidate um, in 2021, and he started remotely from Brisbane um, because Brisbane was not in lockdown um, and <laughs> Melbourne was very much in lockdown. Um, so Walter started remotely, but then he was able to join us here in Melbourne um, at the start of this year. Um, and since then, he's been very busy um, in the lab uh, working on his project. Um, so I'll turn it over to Walter to um, tell us all about his project. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, welcome everyone to my PhD confirmation seminar. Um, I want to start off by um, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Um, so my topic is on infectious laryngotracheitis virus, um, or ILTV in short. Um, my supervisors are Joe, Carol, Turgut and Amir. Um, so I want to start off with a bit of introduction on ILTV. So it's a species of alpha herpes virus, which is a subfamily under the family of herpes virus. It causes respiratory clinical signs um, characterized by nasal discharges, sometimes hemorrhagic nasal discharges, dyspnea, which is um, difficulty breathing, coughing, and mortalities. Um, the virus is transmitted by aerosol or expectorant, and it causes significant production and therefore economic loss in the poultry industry. Um, the control of IOTV is mainly by vaccinations and biosecurity measures, which we'll get into. Um, so a bit on the pathogenesis of ILTV. The main routes of entry for ILTV um, in birds um, are upper respiratory tract and conjunctival of birds. And it replicates in the epithelium of nasal cavities, um, trachea, larynx, and conjunctiva, and it causes pathology in the trachea. The virus can disseminate to different organs in infected birds and it undergoes latency in trigeminal ganglion and trachea. Um, by undergoing latency, it avoids recognition by immune system and the latent infection can then be reactivated by stresses. A little bit on the history of IOTV. So um, the virus itself is first discovered in 1925 in the US. Um, and since then, um, different classes of IOTV can be identified um, using different genetic materials from different genes. Um, so class one to five have previously been identified prior to 2007 in Australia. Um, since then, uh, class two and from there, class nine and 10 um, have been reported and class two was the previously most prevalent classes. Um, and now that has been replaced by class nine and 10. Um, the, the, there's a linkage between class nine and 10 and concurrent use of Australian and European IO vaccine, IOTV vaccine strains, uh, which I'll get into in a second. Uh, but the key message from that is that IOTV evolves over time um, and that changes with the disease that it can cause um, in, the, in the industry. So vaccination for IOTV. Um, most of the vaccines used in Australia are life attenuated vaccines. Um, so Soetis um, is the manufacturer for two of them. Um, one of them is the strain A20, the other one is the strain SA2. Both of these can be given via eye drop or drinking water methods. Um, and the third one is um, made by MSD um, and it's the service strain of the vaccine. And that's, that can be given in an eye drop method. These vaccines are effective in controlling clinical cases, but not viral replications in infected birds. Um, and this has an implication on vaccine safety because um, number one, um, there's a high frequencies of recombination occurring um, between and in the virus strains. And secondly, um, although these vaccines are attenuated, um, they're not attenuated in a trad traditional sense. So um, in an incorrect or uncontrolled dosage um, of vaccines that are given to the birds, that can cause 
um, the birds to get actually sick from the virus from the vaccine itself, and it can cause adverse effects. And therefore, um, vaccine safety um, can be affected by that. A um, little bit on recombination. So recombination is um, the main evolution pathway for ILTV. Um, like I said before, ILTV as a species changes constantly. Um, recombination occurs between two different strains, uh, and that was first reported within APCA in 2012. And since then, frequent recombination in both field and laboratory settings have been described and reported. Um, so recombination basically is um, when there's co-infection of two different strains of IOTV in one host cells and causing uh, mixing and exchanging of virus genetic material um, or recombination of the genome sequences, um, causing a hybrid new strain. Um, and there's a potential for new recombinant virus strains to have a higher level of um, virulence and transmissibility. Um, and again, because of inappropriate vaccine usage, um, that can um, cause recombination in this scenario as well. So um, to summarize all that, um, my project focus is to examine the emergence, um, distribution, persistence, and transmission of IOTV recombinant viruses in the natural host species, which is chicken, um, and determine how vaccination practices influence these processes. Um, there are three main aims of my project. The first one being um, to describe viral and epidemiological characteristics of an outbreak of infectious laryngotracheitis. The second one is to characterize IOTV recombination and the effect of drinking water vaccination in specific pathogen-free chickens or SPF chickens um, in an experimentally um, setting where they are co-infected with two IOTV field strains. And aim number three, in vivo characterization of key recombinant viruses in SPF chickens. Um, so for aim one, to describe an outbreak. Um, so this particular outbreak um, is from a broiler chicken farm in Victoria. It's a commercial broiler chicken farm. It has around 43 to 44,000 birds per shed, and it has seven sheds in total within the same property. Um, and the information provided by this property um, is in the form of mortality data in an Excel sheet um, and different samples that were submitted. So there were three tracheal samples submitted in formalin and four tracheal samples um, submitted in viral transport media. So starting with the, the data um, set. So again, um, the outbreak was from a broiler chicken farm in Victoria. Um, the outbreak occurred in September, 2021. And this is the, the, an example of the Excel sheet that I got from this um, property. So we can see here the age is the number of days um, that the birds have been in this particular shed. Um, mortality and culls, so natural mortality and culls, cull, um, the birds that have been um, culled for the reasons that are listed here. Um, and this is the, the total daily mortality in this column. Um, and each of the seven sheds um, basically have their own um, table. And um, the vaccines that were used um, on this property is the A20 um, vaccine in drinking water form, given on day 13 and day 21 here. Um, so from there, using this data, um, the, the graph that was plotted, um, first off, I wanna just put it in a graphical sense uh, or content to see how it looks like. Um, in a chart. So this is a daily uh, mortality rate of chickens per shed. Each of the lines in different color represents um, the daily mortality rate of each shed um, as I've written here. Um, this axis here is the number of days of these birds in this um, property. Um, and then this here is the daily mortality rate in percentage. Um, so we can see there's an initial spike in daily mortality rate. And that is somewhat expected um, due to the age of the hatchlings being moved into a large group um, and the stress of being relocated itself. Um, and so that is somewhat expected. And then after that, um, it calms down a little bit. Um, like I said, vaccines given on day 13 and day 21. Um, beyond that, um, given the clinical signs that the producer was noticing at the time here, as well as the spike in mortality, um, 
that would be the actual onset of the outbreak of IOTV. So the producer was noticing um, dyspnea, coughing, um, and sort of the hemorrhagic nasal discharges we've mentioned before. So um, starting at this point, um, we're starting to see a spike in the, the daily mortality rate. And from there, uh, a cumulative mortality rate um, graph was made. And so, um, again, this is in each of the sheds uh, in different colors. Um, this is still the number of days um, of the birds in the sheds. And this, again, is the percentage um, cumulative mortality rate we can see here. Um, so from the initial data set, um, the data that was used to get to this point was the number of days in production, starting population, um, and then the total mortality in the form of daily calls plus the mortalities. Um, and the reason why these numbers were, were made is to, to, to estimate the R0 value. So the R0 value is the basic reproduction number. Um, that's the average number of um, individual and initial case um, can infect in a population with no immunity. So um, we can see here um, there's a little steeper part in the cumulative mortality rate, and that part would be um, the actual um, outbreak of IOTV within this property. Um, it starts off at different um, rate, and we can see here the earliest shed seems to be starting here, and then that kind of spread across the entire uh, property. And this property already uses all the um, recommended biosecurity measures. So we can see even with this biosecurity measures in place, the virus can still effectively cause an outbreak within the entire property. Um, from there, um, to estimate the R0 value, um, linear regression of the natural log of each um, of the cumulative curve was made only at the part of the exponential growth phase, so the steeper part of the curve we saw on the slide earlier. Um, and then the slope of each line then represents the epidemic growth rate. So we can see here, um, this is the actual um, days in the period of exponential growth, so the steeper part of the um, cumulative curve. And this is um, the, the, the natural log of the um, with, with linear regression in place. Um, and so in this equation here, y equal to um, 0.05x, um, the number before the x um, is the slope or the growth rate of the epidemic. And each of the shed has their own um, slope um, value as well. So each of them has their own growth rate. Um, and then the R0 value of each shed was then calculated using this expression here. Um, I'll explain the expression a little bit because there's a lot of symbols there. So L and D represents the average duration of the latent and infectious periods, respectively. Um, latent period in this case is not the latent cell I was talking about before um, in regards to herpes virus or IOTV. Um, latent period in this scenario means the incubation period um, for the outbreak. So from the time point of the virus infecting the birds to when they actually start to be infectious and showing symptoms. Um, lambda is the growth rate or the slope at which exponential growth occurred. M and N are gamma distribution parameters um, and therefore allowing assumptions um, for latent and infectious period to be varied, meaning that within this infected class, um, there can be subdivisions. Um, M and N were assumed to be um, 100 to allow for a tight distribution around the mean in this estimation. So like I said before, the epidemic growth rate or the slope of those linear regressions um, of each shit here um, are, are um, shown here. And the mean of them um, is around 0 0.076. And from there, um, it was estimated with the latent period um, to be assumed at two days um, and infectious period to be um, assumed between two, four, and six days. Um, the reason why these assumptions were made for the infectious period um, is because looking at births that are infected experimentally, peak infection is usually um, on day four. And by day six, um, all of the births that were tested positive would have been tested positive on day four as well. So beyond that, um, peak virus um, level would be falling down already. So um, infectious period was assumed to be um, two, four, and six days in my estimation. And we can see here, these are the, um, the R0 value in each of the sheds. Um, shed one to shed four, um, fairly similar. So 1.18 to 1.35 in that range. Um, 
Shet 5 and Shet 7 seems to have a higher level, so 1.28 to 1.73 in the case of Shet 7. Overall, the mean um, are not value depending on the assumption on the infectious period duration um, ranges from 1.25 to 1.46. Comparing that to a study that was was done also in, in Victoria in 2011. Um, the Arnott value was 1.98 to 2.93. Um, and those data um, in this particular study was from 2008 to 2010. Um, again, from the outbreak that um, I've looked at, um, the Arnott value was from 1.25 to 1.46. The difference um, between these two studies, keeping in mind is um, the one in 2011, um, the birds were unvaccinated, whereas the birds in 2021, um, they're vaccinated. Although both of these two um, groups of birds are from a field setting. Um, and um, keeping that in mind, moving on to the other samples that were submitted um, within this outbreak in 2021. Um, so there were samples that were submitted in formula. Um, these samples were sectioned and then H and E stained um, to assess them in a histopath setting. So, um, histopathological scoring system of IOTV um, was established in 1990 um, in this study, and it ranges from grade zero to five. Grade zero being normal, um, and grade five being severely um, affected. So, this is an example of how a normal trachea um, would look like in a cross section um, under histology. Um, so this is the wall of the trachea, and this here would be the lumen um, of the trachea itself. Here we can see a, a nicely arranged um, layer of epithelial cells. Um, so they are tightly packed with glandular tissues or glandular cells in between, and they each have little cilia on top of them um, to help move mucus within the trachea lumen. Um, so the grading system here um, that was described, it's based on the loss of epithelial structure, um, infiltration of replica cells within the epithelial layer, um, leukocytes or inflammatory cells infiltration, and the sloughing of the epithelium away from the lamina propria layer and the cartilage layer here. So um, with the sample um, that have been stained from this particular outbreak in 2021, we can see that there's um, massive infiltration of leukocyte or inflammatory cells, so the darker cells here, um, and mucosal hemorrhage, so infiltration of replica cells um, within the mucosal layer. Um, it, it's not showing sloughing of the mucosa yet, um, but we're seeing the loss of the glandular tissue um, before. And um, Zooming in as well, we can also see um, some, some syncytia, so cellular damage and cellular death within the mucosal layer as well. And so from there, um, the histopath changes were graded to be a grade three using the scoring system. Um, moving on to other samples, um, they were submitted in the viral transport media. Um, so these trachea sample were from four birds. Um, that were submitted again in VTMs. Um, unfortunately, the samples weren't identified to belong to you know, different sheds in itself. They, they just come um, as samples from four different birds. Um, these samples were homogenized and inoculated in chorioallantoic membrane or CAMs of embryonated um, SBFX. So just to explain a little bit with, with that, um, this is an egg with an embryo inside. Um, so CAM would be um, a membrane um, that's within um, the eggshell itself. And the goal of the CAM inoculation and the process is to separate the layer um, away from the eggshell using negative pressure. And then from there, um, the sample were then inoculated um, onto the CAM themselves um, for a period of around five days or so. Um, after that, after five days, so come time of harvesting, um, we can see that um, there are little pox formed on the um, cam themselves. So um, this little white circle we can see on the cams are little pox formation indicating um, cellular infection, um, likely by um, the virus in, in this case. And we can see that on another um, cam as well, again, on these little white circles on there. 
um, the goal of which is to isolate the virus within these tracheal samples. Um, each of these CAMs were then um, homogenized um, and that had gone through a viral quantitation step. So um, first I wanted to confirm this presence of IOTV within um, these samples. So um, the viral load were measured using a, a UR15 primer qPCR just to confirm that there's uh, a positive results from these samples and there were. Um, so these samples were then re-inoculated into a new set of CAMs as a step of viral passage and amplification. Um, and a total of 16 CAM samples were then um, made um, and they were again aliquoted as well. Um, these 16 samples were then quantified with um, the UR15 primer qPCR again um, to assess the, the viral load within these samples. Um, and I was able to achieve um, viral load more than 10 to the power of seven genome copy numbers per mil um, from these samples. Um, and four of these samples from the original four tracheal samples um, were then sent for whole genome sequencing. So these samples were sent to Charles River for whole genome sequencing. Um, the data was analyzed using Genius Prime. Um, processes that have been completed so far were trimming, assembling um, with reference to class nine genome of ILTV. Um, and they've been aligned um, against other Australian ILTV strains as well. The analysis of the sequence is currently still under progress, but what I'm trying to aim for is to see how it correlates with the other strains. So both previously different classes of IOTV, as well as the vaccine strains that have been used in Australia. Um, so to summarize the, the part one or aim one of my, um, of my project, um, so to describe um, an outbreak of IOTV um, in a, the outbreak was um, in a vaccinated commercial broiler chicken farm um, in Victoria. And the outbreak was in September 2021. Um, the R0 value um, from this outbreak of IOTV was 1.25 to 1.46. Um, there were histopathological changes um, consistent with IOTV infection noted in this outbreak. Um, virus, or sort of the IOTV virus, um, have been isolated. And currently, um, sequence analysis is in progress. Anecdotally, um, and also um, with, with data provided from this producer, um, they're using a newer vaccine protocol. So they're using a vaccine called FactSafe in drinking water form. It is showing a much lower growth rate of the virus. So I was unable to estimate the R0 value from this newer data set because um, there was not even a distinguishable exponential phase. So I couldn't actually calculate the, the actual slope. I can't separate the time frame. Um, so that concludes kind of the, the, the aim one of my projects. Moving on to aim two. So just a reminder, my, the second aim is to characterize IOTV recombination um, and the effect of drinking water vaccine in SBF chickens um, that are co, um, experimentally co-infected with two IOTV field strains. Um, so this is an in vivo experiment conducted by Turgut in 2021. Um, and looking at recombination between two field strains of IOTV. So um, the two field strains that were used were CSW1 and V199. Um, and this is the timeline of the um, experiment. So we're looking at um, co-infection, well, first vaccinating these birds in different vaccine strategies, um, and then co-infecting them with the two strains I've mentioned before. Um, the aim or the, the, the goal of the, the experiment is to look at how different vaccine strategies um, might affect or change the evolution of IOTV in the form of recombination. Um, these birds were vaccinated in, in a drinking water method as well. So um, these data somewhat can be comparable to the field outbreak um, as previously described. Um, and like I said, the goal is to compare viruses that are replicating um, in in vaccinated birds versus birds that are not vaccinated um, altogether or birds that are vaccinated in a suboptimal kind of setting. And, and these samples were then um, used to, to look at recombination in the form of using a TACMAN um, recombination genotyping assay um, to look for specific genetic variations of each strains. Um, and from there to detect recombination in the progeny or viruses after mixed infection.
Um, so, so far, the samples from this in vivo experiment, um, parts that are completed are the DNA extractions from these tracheal swaps, qPCR, again, just to confirm and quantify the viral levels in these samples, um, and plaque purification and picking to isolate these viruses. Um, the next step um, would be to complete the Tacman genotyping process to actually um, see what recombination we, we are looking at. And from there, um, there are going to be a few selected recombinant viruses that will undergo full genome sequencing as well. So for what's next in my project for aim number one, so for the outbreak description, um, would be to complete sequence analysis of um, the viruses that were isolated. Um, and then examining these viruses in vitro, um, looking at the growth kinetics of, um, of them. Looking also at the um, recombination patterns of these viruses, and from there, um, it will be utilized in AIM-3, which is to in vivo um, characterize these viruses, um, both um, looking at effects in virulence, transmissibility, pathogenicity, and just to see how they do behave in vivo. For AIM-2, um, we're trying to compare the difference in recombinants detected in vaccination, in vaccinated versus unvaccinated birds. And again, for AIM-3, in vivo in vitro assessment of tissue, tissue tropism, virulence level, um, transmissibility and pathogenicity um, by using the dominant recombinants from AIM-2 um, and um, looking at how they do behave. So to conclude, that didn't work. Um, IOTV is um, ever evolving in, in a way of recombination. Um, investigation in how transmissibility and virulence can be affected by vaccination strategies is very important in controlling the, the disease and that has a significant social economic impact. That concludes my seminar. Um, I wanna say thank you to my supervisors, Joe, Carol, Turgut, and Amir, um, my chair, Andrew, and special thanks to Matthew, Denise, Marisil, Andreas, and Gaia for the help along the way as well. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Walter. That was a really um, interesting talk. Um, very happy to uh, turn over to the audience um, for any questions or comments or thoughts. Um, I'm happy to for people just to unmute themselves um, and ask questions or alternatively, um, people might like to put something um, in the chat, perhaps. While people are thinking of questions, I can think of a couple of questions. Um, so, Walter, you're, you're, um, you've got sort of two streams, I think, in your PhD project. You're looking at um, field outbreaks or a field, at least one field outbreak of ILTV compared with um, your experimental um, sort of controlled conditions um, in, in um, experimental birds. Mm -hmm. um, how well do you think that those two different um, streams can be compared? Do we think the, the experimental work is a close mirror of what goes on in the field or do you expect that there's a few differences uh, between experimental infection and field infection? There's going to be quite a bit of difference, unfortunately, between field and experimental setting. Um, obviously, in field, there's not a lot of things you can control. And so um, with with introduction of different strains of IOTV um, in, a, in a field setting, um, I think, yeah, you can't really control exactly what comes into play or what strains is available for the for the mixing in, in that sense. Um, but I think with, with experimental setting, it, it's gives us an insight into how different strains can be affected by vaccine strategies. And then that is also a knowledge we can then apply um, to a field setting, even though it's not exactly identical, the principle should stay the same. Great, thank you. No, that's a good answer. Any other additional uh, questions from audience? We have some uh, well wishes in the uh, the comment section, They're saying a great um, presentation and uh, fantastic talk, Walter. Great talk. Uh, best wishes for your PhD work. Thanks, Corinne. Thanks, Abdul. Thanks, Matthew. Great.
Well, thank you, everyone. So I think um, we'd just like to thank everyone for coming along today. Um, and obviously, Walter's talk was very clear um, and not too many questions required. So um, thank you for coming. Thank you, Aaron, for organising everything. And of course, thanks and congratulations uh, to Walter for his talk. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.